I'm 53. Oh, actually 52. I'm almost 53. Um, I live in New York City. I lived here for 30 years now. I grew up in different parts of America. Um, was born in the Midwest. Moved around a lot as a kid. Um, but went to school in California and moved here in 1994. I'm a visual artist. I work in many mediums, predominantly painting, uh, installation, and video, um, which is now extended to uh, character animation, 3D, and other forms of digital um, art, which I uh, work within, use within my painting practice. I became interested in art as a teenager, I would say. Um, as a teenager, I was quite involved in a lot of uh, underground musical subcultures in the 1980s. Um, in the US, this was a sort of an explosive time for uh, independent music. Um, and I became aware of, of visual art very much through musicians and countercultural figures that I looked up to in the music world um, in, in Europe and England, but predominantly. And they would oftentimes talk a lot about, about subcultural movements. They were interested in art in the past and artists. And I sort of started exploring in the library through, through musicians I emulated and looked at their art on the back of record covers. Music videos were just starting. So there was this whole performance that was enacting about identity and opening up spaces and identity to be more fluid and questioning conventions. And you know, there was punk, there was industrial music things that I was really active in as a kid uh, that led me to go to art school later on. I started with drawing, yeah, uh, actually from life, um, which sort of evolved into a more conceptual approach to painting. I started reading a lot of philosophy as a young person, um, and I got involved in a lot of uh, early networking that was going on through mail art and, um, other forms of, of art that um, I used to record a lot of concerts and record and trade cassette tapes through the mail. And I had a bootleg cassette company. I then started a record label later on. So I was involved in a lot of networking. And I think eventually that developed as the internet, this actual network appeared in our lives. My interest moved very much into depicting how that was changing, um, what it meant to be a human and what it felt like to be a person. Um, so that was a very rapid transition into the 90s. Now, it's very important for me that uh, my work expresses the feeling, at least as I feel it, of what it feels to be alive right now as a person. And I think that the most important component of that uh, to me is this feeling of incorporating the handmade with the machine made, because I think we navigate our day so, so uh, day after day, so repetitively through having to deal with a lot of, a lot of machines, you know, whether they're invisible abstract machines like algorithms and platforms and softwares and surveillance or very physical machines like the devices we use, computers, um, printers, uh, other things that I use in my work. But so I, I think it's very important for me that, that the process I use the paintings couldn't be made without the help of a machine, you know, whether it's a computer, a printer, a CNC router, a laser. But at the same time, they also need the hand. They need the human to be involved because I think it's very important for me to keep the sense of presence of a person alive in my work. Um, so in that regard, I've developed a multimedia approach to painting that I hope echoes the way in which technology produces digital space. Um, what you see behind me, these, these sculptures are prototypes for the internal infrastructure of the paintings in the show that I'm um, having in Seoul next month. Um, that sounds a bit abstract, but I think when you see them in person, you'll understand that um, I'm trying to develop an approach to painting that, that kind of allows the painting to function something like a cell phone or a, or a computer. It's a blank template that information passes through. Um, and as you can see, these are blank. They end up multicolored and multifaceted and quite maximalist in their compositions, but they begin as these completely bare and empty things, not unlike a phone when you buy it. Um, and you fill it up with information, you shuffle it around and you create space and put lights on it. Oh, it has affected it tremendously, um, but it's also, I'm fascinated with, um, you know, I, I think in the early aughts, I, I really changed my work um, 
as I noticed how technology was changing the lives of of my my personal life, but also the lives of my friends and my social life and the way I communicated with people. And I really, at that time, I wasn't I wasn't working with uh, you know figurative painting so much, and I, I developed an interest in depicting people because I really was fascinated with how people, particularly people I knew, were changing. You know, when people started to get phones and email and join social platforms, they started performing their personality in completely different ways. You know, so if you were texting with someone versus emailing with them versus talking in person. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but certain parts of their personality were liberated and certain were certain were were put behind the scenes. And you saw that that people could produce a completely different form of presence depending on how they were communicating. And I was really interested. Well, how can painting, how can painting convey this? You know, this this new sort of synthetic body that we can produce performatively behind the screen. Um, so that was that was something I became very interested in. I think today this has come so far that we're actually living in a kind of augmented reality. You know, I think maybe even 10 years ago, we could describe our virtual life and our actual life as very separate, you know, and you would think of this kind of dualism, you know, like, oh, I, I do this online and I do, but now I think they're so intertwined that they're inseparable. And I don't think it's possible to go offline anymore. Going offline is actually a you know, privilege that only the wealthiest people can can achieve. You know, if you have a job, you certainly can't go offline. You got to work. You know, you got to be available. You know, um, so this augmentation, I think, you know, we bring our knowledge of another person's performance online to meeting them in person, and we 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 create that mem we we put that memory together with what it feels like to talk to them, and I think that combination is how we now think about what our friends are like, what people we admire are like, what our coworkers are like. And that's something that's very different than even eight or 10 years ago. And it's accelerating so quickly now where the, the online persona is becoming so detached from the actual person. Um, yet I don't think you can say one is more authentic than the other. I think the idea of authenticity is now something of the past. Um, so I think that this these subjects of the body and presence and abstraction are, are subjects I've been really interested in, particular the last ten to fifteen years. Well, I think I think reality is quite surrealistic now. Um, I think it's quite absurd. I think it's quite humorous. Humor is something very important to me. Um, I think surrealism is kind of dated to the twentieth century. I think today's surrealism is something much. It's much stranger in trying to figure out is something more, what is more real than something else, you know? And with AI now, the whole question of the authentic real is, is really going out the window. Um, the, the, the new works I'm making, um, the new show you're going to see in Seoul is entirely made in CGI animation software. And every component, every piece of content and every painting was purchased on websites that sell digital assets for gaming, creating commercials, short films, uh, so forth and so on. So everything there has been has been acquired in the process of shopping of sorts. And the surrealistic element of these compositions, because there is a surrealism, I think you're accurate in describing them this way, this stream of consciousness narratives, which are very strange in these paintings, to me above all, um, are an index of, of the kind of um, stream of consciousness that happens when one shops online, you know? You say you buy a pair of shoes and you say, I actually want that shirt. And I come to think of it, I need this household stuff to like, and then actually I need some food, you know, like, so I tried to really embrace this um, kind of very organic process of, of buying assets on these gaming websites and these websites that sell uh, rigged models, they're called, where you can make, you know, a character or an object or, uh, you know, a, a background material move and you can build a completely three-dimensional virtual environment, you know, or what, what could become a virtual environment. In my case, it becomes like a short, small film set. I put all the pieces together like a puzzle. I put lights and colors. Uh, I print it out and I paint on top of it. So it's really kind of like very symmetrical to building a game. At the end of the process of each particular composition, I work with uh, an animator, my friend Phil Vanderheiden, and a musician, Aaron Dillaway, and we have a video collaboration called Puppet Warp, and we animate every painting's
trying to make a short video loop or film. And in the, in the show, you'll see all the paintings, both as a still image and as a moving short video, um, which is, it's very, it's very uh, uncanny to see what you are used to seeing as a still image go into motion and depict a narrative story, which are often quite absurd and funny. Um, so these are some of the themes in the show that are coming up. Yeah, I think, I think really trying to, it, I think it really starts from trying to depict the body and trying to depict what it feels like to be a person. But um, some of the things in the past that have inspired me is, you know, having a longstanding history in music. I think making, a, having parties, you know, I used to be a party promoter, a concert promoter. I used to produce records. I was a DJ for many, many years. Um, making a party is, is very similar to making a painting. It's about creating lights and composition and atmosphere and sounds and the right combination of people and decorations and you know smoke and lights and mirrors and I think it's a it's a it's a very um, important thing to bring people together, particularly as technology and digital capitalism are trying to separate us and keep us alone. You know, at our screens, clicking away monetizing, um, harvesting our data. So I, I always saw, saw music as a kind of uh, resistance force, you know, to bring people together while they were um, feeling quite alone in their daily life. My musical practice was always kind of an antidote to the somewhat lonely nature of being a painter alone in the studio. Um, it's a nice dualistic uh, kind of mode of, you know, going out at night to see your friends, but also, experimenting with things in, in how the body was changing in a very different way with actual people um, to try to have a good time. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and I think also, as I, I mentioned earlier, humor is another important element. Um, all, my music, my, my work in the 90s really came out of philosophies of language and, and writing and punning and using language as a material element that, that uh, created a kind of a very light atmosphere. I still, when I make films, the, the text and the um, script is very important in how it's written. And writing is an important element of my work still. I'm working on a, a big film project right now for my next show next year. Um, so that's another thing. And I think, um, yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, today I think gaming and cultures around self performance and, and you know, workout culture and gaming culture and a lot of cultures that are particularly in America and, and I know gaming in Asia are really now about, I think uh, challenges for identity and questions of identity really used to be about, I need to understand my relationship to the world or to the other. I think now with the way we produce this synthetic body, um, this, this artificial body, the space is no longer between myself and the world, it's between me and my avatar, or me and my synthetic body, and trying to bridge the gap, you know? And I think things like gaming and workout culture are about this almost Pavlovian reward system of like, you know, it, say if you play a game on Twitch or you work out online or you do something where people can see you playing against yourself to try to better yourself. Um, that's a very strange contemporary phenomenon that I think is very different than something that would happen 10 years ago online because you're you're like rooting for the person to become their avatar, to become the fantasy body, you know, uh, whether that's the high score in the game or achieving this physical body that's very artificial, perhaps. Okay. I think beauty filters are fascinating because beauty filters are becoming so divorced from even what you look like to yourself, you know? Um, and there's a lot, there's a new, uh, I've become very interested in something called BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, which is, uh, it's a very serious problem for young teenagers um, in which, I mean, I'm not sure how old you are, but when you grow up with being so accustomed to wearing a filter, you can actually become divorced from your real body when you become more accustomed to seeing yourself with a filter on screen than you do looking in the mirror. And it, there's a new whole wing of psychology now that's trying to understand how to undo this or how to help these kids that are developing this completely uh, distorted image of their own actual body through all the filters they wear <laughs> on screen. My generation is very unusual because I got, I got all these tools in my 30s, okay? 
So Generation X, as we're often called, is this strange generation where we're the only generation to remember life before and after the internet as adults. And it was a very difficult uh, transition for me in particular. Um, I think this is also why I'm interested in the subject because um, you had to completely reformat the way you communicated. And you know, as you know, it learned, gets harder to learn a language as you get older. It gets hard to learn anything when you get older. Um, but at the same time, you also have a criticality of of the thing mit, when with it and without it, you know, with abstraction and without the digital. Um, so it, it's fascinating to try to think of it out, from outside of itself. Um, and those of us that are old enough to remember can still kind of do that. It is a kind of is a kind of body modification that doesn't require you to actually cut your face, though. It's interesting, you know. And in that sense, it's quite cost effective and 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 other classes that culture you know to have some kind of augmentation in your physical body was expensive frankly and when someone saw that you had a facelift or a boob job or butt implants they could sense you're, you're probably part of a certain uh, class contingent now you can just put on a filter and you can be of any class you know um the strange thing is that you still have this body without the filter to go home to and how do you relate to that um so it's quite a, a fascinating topic, I think, that's only becoming more and more absurd. And the strangest thing is that everybody that gets actual plastic surgery, I think they're starting to become, they almost all look the same. Like there's a certain kind of homogenizing force that these filters and actual surgeries aim to produce, which is almost like a kind of an android, um, futuristic um, kind of singular being or something that's very unusual um, because you would think that you would get plastic surgery to look different but you actually get it to look like everyone else i would say a few things um, on a more general philosophical scale i think i would say um, i really in the best case scenario i i, I love trying to stage scenarios that um, allow people to uh, see things they thought they understood as being closed and oppressive and limiting systems of control of identity of communication as actually quite different as to open up systems um, that function to close things down and find space inside them for freedom um, to create hybrid forms of being to create hybrid forms of identity uh, to create social situations which are very um, enjoyable that involve contact with actual people, um, but also to critique that at the same time. Um, on the more formal side and the viewing experience of a painting, it's very important to me that people see my work in person because I'm really trying to develop a different form of space in painting that's very, this very shallow space that it cannot be communicated through the screen, yet it takes inspiration from the, the shallow space of the screen. But there's a very three-dimensional element in these paintings that is created through the CGI um, software uh, that comes from everything being completely synthetically um, choreographed. And um, it looks almost like a sculpture, like people come up to my paintings and they want to touch them because they can't tell if they're actually three-dimensional, um, that being the space of sculpture, like a relief, or if they're actually the illusionistic space of painting, which is flat. So playing with the difference between the flat and the three-dimensional, which I think is a very important visual uh, problem of our time, uh, where we never know what's real and what's, ac what's actual and what's virtual, uh, is something that I, I really like to play with, but I also try to, to make it as optically exciting, just to have a very, um, so your, your, you know, your nervous system gets activated um, in an enjoyable way. Um, by looking at something to help hopefully make you want to continue looking at things and not just scrolling, you know, um, and actually stop and concentrate and look at one thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have an enormous screen in this, a very high resolution screen that uh, the gallery was uh, generous in providing. And I think it's going to be quite exciting because you can see the paintings as you walk in still and you walk around a wall and then suddenly they start moving. And after you've seen a painting move, you realize how it's made. You know, you, you realize it's made with this, this software that's uh, very much a contemporary part of, of other technologies, other forms of, of mass, mass media production. Um, and then when you walk out to see that same painting again, I think you see it differently. So I think the moving 
component of the animated um, software image actually changes your perception of the still image after you see it. So they kind of work in tandem together. Um, and hopefully just something that's been important for, you, for, with, for me for decades is trying to challenge what a painting can be. Um, in the case of this show, it's actually almost making a painting without paint. The paint is the last element that's put back into the painting after the painting is, for the most part, fully constituted without it. It's almost like this supplemental excess, you know? Um, that's the last stage of just marking my hand with these gestural marks, these very thick passages, as well as creating these very um, expressionistic face uh, filters, I call them. So the heads are almost all expressionistically rendered very um, carefully by hand, um, which I, again, think of as like beauty filters. Um, so there's a, there's a combination of, of, again, the machine made and the handmade, um, and then this all gets activated by animation and music to kind of come alive and hopefully make you realize that painting can be something very different than just, you know, the traditional 20th mode of, of gestural figuration, that it can actually be a, a much more complicated, um, oftentimes humorous thing. Yeah, all of Asia as well. I've, I've never had an opportunity to have a solo show there, so I'm super excited. Um, and I'm, I'm super um, extremely curious to see how my work will be received there in comparison to how it's received in America and Europe. Um, I, I've long had an admiration for popular culture there and, and for the way that art works outside of you know, in the West, we have this sort of dominant, very controlling imperatives of modernism. And I'm never have felt completely comfortable with that. And people that uh, kind of work out of that template of meaning production have never really responded to my work in the in in close as as closely as as many Asian collectors and curators and artists I've met have. And I I'm very excited to put this kind of maximalism on display um, and just observe how the conversations change and um yeah i'm just i'm just very excited to put it in a culture outside of my own because i'm you know quite tired of it here and i've just really been wanting to go there for a long time and talk to people um, i've shown all over the world i show mostly in, in new york and europe um yeah different parts of america um but i've had a lot of shows i've been doing this for quite some time so um but th that's one, the one part of the world I've never had an opportunity to have an exhibition. So um, I'm really itching to get over there and um, meet everybody. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, I'm happy to tell you my, my, how I respond when we get, when I get there. I'm sure it will all meet. Um, yeah, it uh, should be very interesting, particularly with freeze and that should make it even more complicated to assess. But um, yeah, can't wait to show my work there. So I've been yeah. working on particular show for quite a long time. Uh, these paintings are very laborious and they take a long time to make. Um, and I, I think I have a nice group here and they have a fantastic new space at Duarte Zucchera that I'm really honored to inaugurate as the first show. Um, and I'm gonna paint the gallery pink, which should be uh, an interesting experience, something I've also always wanted to do. Um, so I think it'll be quite a, um, yeah, quite an a uplifting, spirited uh, space to see some very strange works. And <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm quite sensitive, you know. And I think this comes from an interest in people and observing people. When you paint people for as long as I have, I think you spend a lot of time staring at them, observing their mannerisms, um, trying to realize the complexity of humans. Um, I think I, I listen very well. Um, at the same time, I don't take myself very seriously. I think I have the capacity to pretty, be pretty funny and um, oftentimes not very serious. Um, and I think in terms of ideas and my approach to traditional materials and scenarios, I think I can be pretty inventive with trying to, you know, I, I change my work a lot. I don't know if you observe that from um, looking me up, but um, I get pretty restless every three or four years and I completely start over almost. Um, that's why I've gone through every medium. My paintings have gone through every mode of uh, contemporary technology, whatever it happens to be. Um, I haven't gotten involved with AI recently. It's, I'm sure that that 
role in the next few years. Um, but I try to observe what's happening in the landscape and how we have to, what we have to contend with to perform our lives and try to take that as a medium and bring it into painting and sculpture and performance and, and um, installation. So I think, yeah, I, I try to invent um, with contemporary means in the most um, creative and human, I mean, humorous way I can. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. It sounds like an enormous archive that makes art, approaching art more uh, more feasible or more, um, you know, less intimidating than going to an opening, say. Uh, something unfortunate about the uh, social atmosphere around the art world for decades is there's an awkwardness due to the class, cla the clashes of class, you know? And I think any any visual aid that can make that scenario mo more comfortable, both for people on the artist side and the collector side or the curator or the institutional side and can sort of like encourage connection rather than than um, put put up walls and barriers is, is a good thing um, because it's it's often very difficult for extremely intelligent young people to get involved on either side simply because it's uh, it's a very threatening, strange social scenario. You know, you go into this big, you know, overly lit white cube and just look at a bunch of, you know, people standing there awkwardly. It's not, it's not like going to a concert, you know, or, <laughs> or something that's a little bit more friendly, you know, uh, human feeling. So um, it, it sounds like a good project.